In this section, we'll look at how to apply uh, Euler's equations for rotational dynamics in the case that there are no torques. Looking again at Euler's equations, remember, uh, these are the equations that tell us about how the three different components of a body's rotation uh, change. Remember, omega-1, this is the rotation about the E1 hat axis, which is fixed in the body. So omega-1 dot, that's the way in which that rotation component changes with time. There's two ways in which that rotation component can change. The simplest one is that we can have a, a torque that acts about the E1 hat axis. Of course, a torque will change, can change the rotation rate uh, about an axis. But then the other uh, effect we can see uh, is this term right here. Now remember, this term has to do with the fact that when we're modeling the dynamics, the rotational dynamics of the body, we're in the rotating reference frame itself. And so this term over here on the right-hand side is really the non-inertial term. And so by analogy with our uh, Newton equations, uh, this equation here is ma is equal to the forces that are applied, and because a is being measured in the non-inertial frame, we have these non-inertial terms over here. And so each of these uh, equations basically represents the change in the rotation component uh, as measured in the frame fixed to the body, so painted to the body. And so each of the dynamical equations has a non-inertial term in it here. Okay. And so uh, for 10.8, what we're going to do is ignore the torques. We're going to say that there are no torques. And in that case, we're just going to need to treat the non-inertial terms. And we'll see that, uh, as you might expect, there's going to be some coupling between the different uh, rotational components. Okay, so let's look first at the third uh, component of rotation. Very often we think about um, rotation about the third axis, um, and we assume that uh, the third moment of inertia uh, is the largest of the three. Um, but let's imagine a case where we have uh, three different moments of inertia. So lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2, and that's not equal to lambda 3. And let's further take the idea that rotation components about the other two axes, those are both zero. And we can see from Euler's equation right here that if omega 1 and omega 2 are both zero, then lambda 3 omega 3 is just a constant. And what is that constant? It's just the angular momentum. Now because uh, in this case we have no torques uh, and we only have rotation about a single axis here, we can see that, that that rotation about a single axis, that corresponds to all of the angular momentum. And so what this means is that the omega-3 component is a constant. And now this is true whether or not we're in the rotating reference frame. Uh, so in this case, uh, the component uh, omega-3 for rotation about the E3 axis, that agrees with the rotation that we would see in the inertial frame outside of the body. And so we would see our body just rotating about this E3 axis. And so here's a picture we have. Uh, here's our space frame. So our space frame is, is this uh, black coordinate system. Here's our weirdly shaped body right here. Um, it has an E3 axis, which is defined by the distribution of, of mass uh, inside the body. Um, and if we have no torques and omega-2 and omega-1 uh, are both zero, then we just have the body rotating uh, with a rotation vector, uh, little omega, about the E3 axis. And that's what we see in either the space frame or the body frame, the, body, the rotating frame uh, fixed to the body. Now let's imagine the converse case where omega 1 and omega 2 are not equal to zero. So we have now rotation about the E1, E2, and E3 hat axes. Well according to Euler's equations for zero torque, we can see of course that omega 3 dot that's no longer going to be zero. It's going to be equal to this. So this is the inertial term. And because omega-1 and omega-2 are also not zero, we're going to have uh, non-zero time derivatives for those two uh, rotation components. So omega-1 dot and omega-2 dot are both not going to be zero. And so we're going to have a complicated rotation state uh, 
where the rotation vector itself, omega, is actually going to change with time. Okay, so here's what this situation looks like. So we've got our body frame, E1, E2, E3 hat. That's the frame that's fixed with the body and rotates as the body rotates around. And then in orange here, we have our space frame. So that's the frame that remains fixed in time. We have our rotation vector, omega, right here. Now, as seen in the body frame, according to Euler's equations with no torques, in the body frame, we're going to see omega evolve with time. We will also see omega evolve with time uh, in the space frame. Because uh, in the space frame, there's no reason for the omega vector not to evolve with time. And so what's going to happen is that this body is going to appear to wobble around as seen in the space frame. Now, in the body frame, how, uh, in the body frame, in the frame attached uh, to the body, the angular momentum vector will also appear to evolve with time. But in the space frame, the angular momentum will remain a constant. And that's because there are no net torques acting on the body. Therefore, the angular momentum vector has to remain a constant as seen in the space frame. But in the frame attached to the body again, since that is a non-inertial frame, uh, the angular momentum vector will appear to evolve over time. Okay, so let's explore what would happen uh, to the omega vector uh, as a function of time uh, for a simplified case in which um, omega 1 and omega 2 are both small but non-zero. So what do Euler's equations for zero torque tell us in that case? So that's illustrated here in this figure. Uh, we imagine that uh, the E3 vector points like this, and the omega vector, the rotation vector, points very nearly along E3. So most of, of omega points along E3, but then there's a tiny little component that points either along E1 uh, or E2. OK, so this is what those equations look like in this case. So here's that third uh, dynamical equation, uh, lambda 3 times omega 3 dot. And that, of course, is going to be equal to the difference of moments of inertia lambda 1, lambda 2, times omega 1, omega 2. Now, because omega 1 and omega 2 are both assumed to be small, this whole right-hand side is going to be roughly equal to 0, in which case omega 3 will be a constant. In other words, the projection of the rotation vector omega onto the E3 axis, that's going to remain a constant. And so, so now what we're really interested in is how do the uh, other components change? How do the omega-1 and omega-2 components change? That's uh, given by the other two Euler equations. So lambda-1 times omega-1 dot, that's going to be equal to all of this in square brackets, which is a constant, times omega-2. And then in a similar equation for omega-2 dot, lambda-2 omega-2 dot is equal to all of the things here in the square brackets, which are a constant, times omega-1. And what we'll see is there's going to be some nice coupling between omega-1 and omega-2. So the simplest way to uh, write the dynamical equation for omega-1 and uncouple it from the equation for omega-2 is to take a second time derivative of this equation. We can take a second time derivative of this equation as well, and we'll get the following. And so that's what this equation uh, looks like. We take a second time derivative of our omega-1 dot equation. We get lambda-1 times omega-1 double dot. That's going to be all this stuff, which remember is a constant times omega 2 dot. Well, we have an equation for omega 2 dot. It's this one down here. So omega 2 dot is just going to be lambda 3 minus lambda 1 over lambda 2 times omega 3. Again, all that's a constant times omega 1. And so we can take this equation here, plug it in right there for omega 2 dot. And what we find is omega 1 double dot is going to be all this stuff in here. So uh, things that uh, expressions that involve the differences between moments of inertia by the different axes, and then uh, divided through by the product of two moments of inertia times omega-3 squared, which again is a constant. So omega-1 double dot is going to be equal to a big constant times omega-1 itself. So this equation here looks a lot like a harmonic oscillator equation. And that's, in fact, exactly what we have. So here I've, I've written the same equation again, except I've flipped a sign around so we get a minus sign up front here. Um, there are some interesting behaviors we get. Now, if we have 
the moment of inertia lambda 3, if that's bigger than both moments of inertia lambda 2 and bigger than lambda 1, then this whole term in here, in the square brackets, that's going to be negative. Excuse me, that's going to be a positive term. And so then what we have uh, is an equation that looks like omega 1 double dot is equal to some negative uh, squ uh, positive number, so a negative, num negative 1 times a positive number here, times omega 1. In that case, we have exactly a harmonic oscillator equation. And so uh, the time evolution for omega 1 is going to look just like uh, the harmonic oscillator equation that we always get. So it's going to look a little bit like this. We've got um, some amplitude, cosine maybe. Here's that frequency uh, in the square brackets, square root of that, of course, uh, t times plus delta. So if um, uh, lambda 3 is bigger than lambda 2 and bigger than lambda 1, we will have a harmonic oscillator equation for omega 1. And then because we have this nice coupling between omega 1 and omega 2, uh, we'll have a harmonic oscillator equation uh, for omega 2, which you can show by plugging uh, the solution back in to the two Euler equations. So in the case that lambda, one, lambda 3 is bigger than lambda 2 and lambda 1, you get harmonic oscillator uh, behavior for the omega 1 and omega 2 components. What happens if this term in square brackets is negative? In other words, that lambda 3 is not bigger than both lambda 2 and lambda 1. So here's that same equation again. Uh, omega 2 double dot is equal to minus this, this mess in the square brackets. But now let's imagine that lambda 3 is bigger than lambda 1, but maybe it's smaller than lambda 2. So if lambda 3 is smaller than lambda 2, then this term right here in the square bracket is going to be a negative number. So the square brackets uh, itself is going to be negative, and that means that, that our equation for the omega 1 component is going to be is going to look like this. Omega one double dot is equal to some positive number times omega one, and the solution for that equation. If we want to write the solution in time for that equation, that's going to be an exponential. In other words, uh, omega one will rapidly increase uh, with time. So it will no longer oscillate, it will rapidly increase with time. And eventually, omega-1 will get big enough that we can no longer assume that it was small, which is the assumption we made at the beginning. Uh, we'll get some very complicated uh, nonlinear behavior uh, in this case. You get this sort of rotation when you have unequal, three unequal moments of inertia, uh, and you're not rotating primarily about the moment of, uh, you're not rotating primarily about the axis with the largest moment of inertia. We get some funny uh, nonlinear rotations, of course, and you'll see that uh, in the other video that I've linked to uh, on the video lectures page. So uh, when we get a situation like this where we have most of our rotation component about one of the axes whose moments of whose moment of inertia is not the largest you can get this funny, funny uh, nonlinear behavior. Okay, so let's look at a, another special case, which is particularly illuminating. Let's imagine that uh, the moments of inertia lambda one and lambda two are equal and both equal to some other uh, just lambda, and that that lambda is less than lambda three. Okay, so we have two mo moments of inertia that are equal to one another and less than the moment of inertia about one of the other axes. In this case, you can go back to the Euler equations, and you'll find that uh, omega-3 is going to be a constant. So the, again, the rotation component about the E3 axis fixed to the body, that's going to be a constant. But the omega-1 and omega-2 components are going to change with time. The Euler equations tell us that uh, omega-1 double dot is going to look like this. So that we're going to get this uh, number in, in square brackets, which is a constant, times omega-1. Uh, very similar expression for omega-2 double dot, same number uh, in square brackets times omega-2. And so the number in square brackets, uh, we see uh, if we have lambda-3 bigger than lambda, uh, the behavior of omega-1 and omega-2, they're going to behave as if they're harmonic oscillators, just like we just described. And the frequency, 
uh, of oscillation, we're going to call that omega b, big omega b, and that's just going to be equal to uh, the square root of what's in that square bracket. And so the solution for our rotation vector, omega, as a function of time, is going to look like this. We're going to have the uh, e1 component, which will just be whatever the initial value is uh, for rotation about the 1 component, is going to be uh, multiplied by a cosine of omega b. And then there'll be an omega 2 right here times a sine of omega b. And the, the minus sign here and, and whether or not we have a... a uh, a phase constant that appears inside of this. That all just depends on the initial conditions, but the basic solution is going to look like this. And then, of course, the uh, uh, E3 component, omega-3, that's just going to remain a constant. And so this arrangement looks like this. Again, we have our uh, body, body frame shown in red and our space frame shown in black. The omega vector is just going to rotate around the E3 axis. Uh, in a way described by the previous equations. And so it's just going to rotate around the E3 axis as seen in the body frame. The uh, angular momentum vector, of course, is also going to evolve uh, in a way that's described by the relationship between the angular momentum vector and the rotation vector. Okay? So those are both going to evolve in time as seen in the body frame. However, as seen in the space frame, as seen in the, the fixed inertial frame, Remember, the angular momentum vector, that's going to be a constant the whole time. And so what we're going to actually get in the space frame is that the omega vector, the rotation vector for our body, is going to rotate around the angular momentum vector. And the reason these things look different, remember, is that the E1, E2, E3 vectors, uh, basis vectors, those are rotating with the body. And so those are not remaining fixed in time as far as the inertial frame is concerned. So the, the behavior is actually quite complicated. It's worth reading through the, uh, this portion of the chapter very carefully. Uh, but there's this simple relationship between the evolution of the, diff the different vectors in the different systems. So again, in the inertial frame, the angular momentum vector remains a constant, and the rotation uh, vector for the body revolves around that angular momentum vector. In the body frame, however, the rotation vector rotates around the E3 vector and L, uh, the L vector actually rotates around as well. Because we have uh, the rotation vector of our body rotating around an axis, this is called, this is a type of precession but remember, there are no torques in this system, and so the precession of the rotation vector, uh, in this case, is called free precession, so that the object is free in space, not being acted on by any torques. This is an example of free precession, and it, it seems a little bit like magic. It seems as if the uh, body is rotating, uh, the, the body's rotation is changing with time uh, in the absence of any outside forces, and that's kind of surprising. But it's not really at all surprising, because keep in mind that whenever we have our rotation vector, omega not pointing along one of the three principal axes of rotation, that omega vector will change in time, even in the absence of torques. Go back to the derivations in the chapter, and you'll find that when the rotation vector points along one of the three principal axes, it will not change with time. So if, if the omega vector doesn't point along one of the th three principal axes, the rotation vector will change with time. If, however, the rotation vector does point along one of the principal axes, it will not evolve with time.